second in a series, two mega series, right? Um, <laughs> um, bigger events around translation, uh, interpreting, and multilingualism. We are uh, really happy to be here now to look at translation as or any scholarship and to be sponsoring this coming together from people from many different colleges. So that's a lot of uh, fun for us and it's exciting. At this time, we also want to start talking a little more in public uh, about something that a, a very special group of people have been working on in the name of the College of Humanities. That's an initiative. The people on the committee who have been the core thinkers around all this, although many of you, and frankly, probably all of you here have been thinking about these sorts of things. But our core group is David Gramling. I'd like to thank him. A.P. Grant, I don't think he's here right now. Uh, Terry Pauly, if you could wave or stand up. <laughs> okay. Uh, Chantel Warner, also wave and stand up. There you are, okay. Uh, Sonia Colina, I saw her, there she is, okay. Fabian Alfie, who's up here. And Suzanne Penfero, who's not quite here yet, but will be. So I want to thank them, and please a round of applause for them. They've done a lot of work. In gradual opening of an initiative that will take on more shape as we proceed. Uh, we're calling it now the Language Mediation, Interpreting, and Translation Initiative. In this initiative, we aim to deepen the whole university's long-standing commitment to the study of cross-cultural communication in multilingual and global settings. Today's scholars and professionals all across the world really need to skillfully translate, interpret, and mediate between and among languages as well as between and among speakers, literatures, and cultures from various monolingual and multilingual uh, landscapes, areas, and societies. We also need to be able to understand and research how communities, societies, and regions negotiate their shared civic, ecological, historical, and diplomatic challenges, among many others, in multiple languages all at once, usually. So the College of Humanities LMIT, we're calling it, Language Mediation, Interpreting, and Translation Initiative, that strives to integrate and apply the rich expertise of scholars and units here on campus in interpreting, translation, literature and cultural uh, vers versions of those, media, and applied language studies in order to address our grand challenges in a global, local, and multilingual uh, society and on that scale. So I thank you all very much for being here, especially all of our presenters in this panel and in the coming panels. I'm excited to listen to all this, and um, thank you for being here. And thanks again to our organizing committee, especially Dave Graham. Uh, at this point, I would like to uh, welcome these five wonderful uh, scholars, local scholars, the University of Arizona, uh, Professors Fabian Alfie, Emma Katas, uh, Scott Lucas, Gail Brennan, and Susan Stryker. I would like to invite uh, our moderator, uh, Fabian Alfie, to take a very roomy entire hour to have a conversation uh, with our other uh, speakers today. Thank you, David. Um, we have the, uh, we're panel number one, which is dealing with the tasks of the translator in 2013, and we're going to be wrestling with various questions about, you know, how translation mediates across cultures, genres, and discourses, um, and so forth, but I'd like to ask the panelists first to spend a few minutes and talk about um, each of you, if you could each talk about the work that you do uh, in translation and how it sort of fits into the overall topic of this discussion. Uh, let's start with Dale. Okay, well, um, I'm Dale Brenneman, and I am with the Office of Ethno... Oh, I need to turn this on, don't I? I'm also a technophobe, so... <laughs> um, I work at the Arizona State Museum in the Office of Ethnohistorical Research, and uh, our main goal in that office is to make the Spanish colonial documentary record accessible to scholars and the public alike. One of the ways that we do this is through documentary history projects in which we will translate, transcribe and translate a selection of Spanish colonial documents with a particular topic in mind. 
The project that we're working on at the moment, the moment, it's been the last eight years, is the Autumn P. Posh Documentary History Project. Um, I think most people probably know who the Autumn are, the Tono Autumn are our neighbors to the west. The Peeposh are better known as the Maricopa Indians up in the Phoenix area. Uh, Peeposh is the term that they use for themselves. And this project entails translating, transcribing, I should say, and translating a large selection of Spanish documents that span a period of more than two centuries in time, uh, from 1645 to 1854. These are not literary works. They are documentation of colonial affairs. Uh, they are letters, reports, expedition diaries, census reports, inventories. They involve a wide cast of characters, people from all different parts of Spain, of Mexico with different dialects, different backgrounds. And we have to become familiar with the, not just the handwriting of each individual, but the uh, style of the individual as well. But our focus really is not so much on the style of the document as much as the information that it holds pertaining to, in our case, the Otham and Peeposh. What we're interested in is what information can we, what descriptions are in these documents about these two cultures. Uh, we look for information regarding settlement patterns, subsistence, material culture, social customs, ethnic and linguistic identities, relationships among various groups, roles in historical events, and responses to missionization and Spanish colonization. So it, it struck me that the, the first part of the title for this symposium struck me, in, in others' words. It has for us a, kind of a double relevance in that we are working to make the Spanish colonial documentary record comprehensible to an English-speaking audience. That's, that's the first charge. But in the process of doing so, we're also trying to understand the Autumn and Peeposh experience of Spanish colonization, except that that experience is relayed through Spanish words, through the words of others with a capital O. Uh, Autumn have a, a word that is ob, meaning other, so that would be in the words of ob. Uh, the irony does not escape us on this. But native peoples of the region did not have written languages, and for the most part were unable to read or write. So we are relegated to relying on the Spanish colonial record, which is inherently biased. It's Eurocentric. We do get native voices sometimes, very rarely, but they're almost always filtered and often distorted in that process. So how do we mitigate this? Uh, what we have opted to do is focus on tribal consultation, and we are uh, currently involved in a collaboration with representatives from the Tona Atham Nation's Cultural Center and Museum. Um, our colleagues there have put together a group of elders, a discussion group, and we are then transcribing. They have worked with us in, in making a selection of documents and identifying research questions that they have. Um, they, we are then transcribing documents, translating them into English, putting them into some kind of historical context for them, and providing this group, this discussion group, copies of the translations that they then read and discuss among themselves. The idea being to get feedback from them, uh, commentary on what they're reading, that we can incorporate ultimately into our published versions um, what we're shooting for is not so much um, 
incorporating it ourselves, but actually getting written contribution from them stating their perspective on these documents. Uh, the other way that we can mitigate is um, through critical use of other uh, sources of data, such as ethnographic information, archaeological information, paleoenvironmental information. This all works its way in. And I think that pretty well covers it for the moment. Thank you, Dale. Sure. <coughs> Fascinating project. Um, yeah. Jaime, and before we get started, Jaime, um, had a uh, new arrival this week on Monday. Bling, uh, bling, <laughs> bling. Uh, Diego was nine, yes. pounds, nine pounds, eight ounces, is that right? Uh, seven ounces. Seven nine ounces, ounces. Seven okay, ounces. close enough. Uh, <laughs> and this, this uh, it speaks to Jaime's uh, uh, stamina that he's here and upright. Uh, if you've ever had a newborn baby, uh, I'm surprised you're awake. Bling, bling, yeah. bling, bling. Yeah, it has been a wonderful experience, really. But the credit goes to my wife, Laura, who is the one who carried it out. And, and, and yeah. <laughs> That's a little. It would be a lot worse if you had to do that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> will be a first, It'll too. <laughs> uh, but she's been fantastic, and she had to put a long struggle. Uh, <clears throat> but everything came out wonderfully. Thank you very much. Uh, Fascinating. Diego. <laughs> Diego. Diego, yeah. Diego Lewis, actually, because we were looking for names that work well in both languages. So, okay. <coughs> All right. Well, a uh, fascinating project. What I would like to do is to uh, present several recent projects that I've been involved uh, uh, with and several translations, but I also would like to talk a little bit about my work as an interpreter. And David, I think that you have some uh, links there to the some recently published books that I had the privilege of uh, translate and being involved with. The first one <coughs> is Cave City and Eagle's Nest, that is an interpret an interpretive journey through the map of Conticha Number Two. This is the culmination of an international project, several years in the making, and a series of conferences organized by the Moses Mesoamerican Archive that focus on 16th century pictorial manuscript known as the Mapa de Cuautinchan number no. two. It's an extraordinary document that contains over 700 images and symbols relating to, relating the story of the emergence and migration of the Chichimec people in central Mexico. It is a document that <coughs> tells about the the community's history and the claim over the surrounding landscape and many other occurrences about along the way. When I say the claim, claiming about the surrounding landscape is because this document dates from uh, 1540, barely two decades after the fall of the Aztec uh, Empire, and it was prepared by the lords of the House of the Eagle as a legal document in order to preserve their heritage and to claim their right over the surrounding la <coughs> land from which they were being dispossessed. The map recently underwent extensive physical analysis and conservation and a systematic photographic survey at the uh, Museo Antropologico de Mexico and the restoration has been really fantastic. It is, uh, I have copies of the book here that will be for display uh, later on, but I hopefully you can see there is a Spanish uh, version of the book that, that will be the second link, and hopefully you can see it in the screen right now. It is <coughs> a project of the uh, mm, Rockefeller Foundation for Latin America, and the editors have been Professor David Carrasco from Harvard University and Scott Sessions from University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and it has been published by the New Mexico University Press. It has been re uh, re <coughs> reviewed by the New York Review of Books uh, as uh, one of the feature outstanding publications of the year. And I was involved in the project, and I translated eight of the 15 essays that made the book. The second project that I completed recently is a very different uh, animal. It, the title, and that will be the, th the, the third and fourth links there, David, 
is Spanish culture behind barbed wire memory and representation of the French concentration camps 1939-1945. This is a book by Francie Kate Harris, who is a professor of Hispanic studies at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. And this book tells the story of tens of thousands of Spanish Civil War refugees who were held in internment camps in France during the period period immediately following the end of the Civil War. It was a massive exodus and over 250 uh, former Republicans were imprisoned in concentration camps in the land of Liberté, Galité and Fraternité. This is a note not a very well-known uh, historical episode that needed research and documentation. And uh, Professor Kate Harris combines close textual analysis of former inmates' diaries, poetry, drama, and fiction with a carefully researched historical perspective. And he <coughs> explores the process of cultural reconstruction that takes place and that begins behind, behind this, uh, the barbed wire of these concentration camps and that ultimately will encode the physical spaces, this, uh, the, the ethos and the aesthetics of the later uh, subversion, resistant, and political agency that takes place as opposition to the dictatorship <coughs> uh, that uh, the new order brought into the country. I think this is a book of particular interest for scholars and students of exile studies, Spanish Civil War history, and so it received an honorable mention at the Modern Languages Association, and it has been, my translation has been published by Anthropos in Spain and Siglo XXI in Latin America. I also translate regularly for Quod Libet, that is the, uh, I would say the leading uh, magazine in music theory in the Spanish language that is published by the University of Alcala, been uh, cooperating with them for a number of years. And more recently, I translated a number of chapters from different books from the Cambridge Companion to music on Strauss, Mozart, uh, contemporary music, and so on. And <clears throat> that, as a translator, uh, those are the, some of the most uh, salient uh, projects of the last two years. Uh, but I also am working, um, I'm a working interpreter. I'm a fairly certified interpreter. I'm a legal interpreter, so I interpret regularly in the federal court. And I'm also a medical interpreter, uh, and a conference interpreter. And I, I want to talk a little bit about my work as, a, as an interpreter because uh, interpretation really is oral translation. Well, actually, translation is written interpretation mm -hmm. because we always put the emphasis on translation because of the prestige that translation has. But if we look at interpretation in terms of histori the historical record and the number of people who relay in order to preserve their identities and their cultures on interpretation, on oral communication, it really is a much more salient and a much more important uh, means of cross-cultural communication that translation in many senses, not in all. So I'm very fond and very proud of my work as an interpreter, which requires also a different set of skills. In translation, you have to preserve uh, all the content. You have to be main, very mindful of the voice of the author, of the academic and scholarship record. In interpretation, the premium is more in providing an acceptable equivalent on the spot. Therefore, your cognitive and moral skills have to be very well integrated in order to be able to process sometimes what is an onslaught of incoming data at rates of over 300 words per minute in very, very high technical registers in places where the stakes are very high too, like courthouses, hospitals, immigration centers, and so on. So I think that that's a very, very, very important part of the world of translation. Great. Thank you. I was hoping I wouldn't have to follow you uh, <laughs> because I'm really an amateur uh, translator. About six years ago or uh, so, I noticed that an institute called the Royal Al Bayt Institute in Amman, Jordan, was sponsoring a series of translations of Quran commentaries. And they were doing it in such a way that the basic translation was available online, so free to everybody, whereas the annotated edition was published by a not-for-profit uh, spirituality-oriented bookstore uh, publisher called Fons Vitae, I believe in Kentucky. 
And so I asked, oh, are you working on a certain commentary by a, one of the earliest large commentaries by a man known as a Tabari conventionally. He has a much longer name, who lived in Baghdad most of his life, uh, one of the most prominent religious scholars of the late 9th and early 10th centuries. And the email reply from a person whose name I recognized, but we had never met, was, would you like to do it? And I said, oh, um, well, <laughs> I wasn't asked for a CV, a sample of a previous translation. There were a lot of red flags that probably should have come up earlier in this large project. Uh, but I said, oh, what the heck, you know, I guess, it's, what could go wrong with the 10th century Quran commentary? <laughs> uh, he's not going to be offended, you know, so that's, that's okay. Uh, so it's a 30 volume book, but of course, of course, I did not commit to 30 volumes. Um, I made sure that do, they wanted me to do, they, I had some ideas for what I would do, they had some ideas for what I would do, and they were paying, so I did what they wanted, um, which is often the case when you're getting paid. Uh, and their selection was very nice, they didn't want any of the controversial verses in the Quran, they wanted nice verses and, and surahs that have various blessings associated with them, so I said, you know, first time round, why not, we'll just, we'll just do this. I'd read most of the, no, I'd read some of the passages they wanted me to translate, others I hadn't. Uh, I knew the, the, the chapters of the Quran, but I didn't know what the commentary actually said. But I figured it would probably be interesting. And um, so they wanted me to do it in three years, about five to six hundred pages. Uh, this was when I was an assistant professor, not on tenure track. And I said, maybe four years? And they said, okay. And they gave me more money. I don't know why they did that, but I guess they figured it was another year of work. Uh, it was supposed to have been done a year or two ago. Uh, uh, due to some very unforeseen and, and tragic circumstances, I became department head. Uh, me becoming department head wasn't the tragic part, but what led to me becoming department head was the tragic part. And certainly advice, if you're planning on doing a major translation project, I would recommend against becoming department head uh, if you can avoid that. Uh, or just, you know, fortunately they've been very understanding, so my next due date was last September uh, for the project, which Needless to say, I have a complete draft, but as you all know, uh, it's best not to publish a draft. Um, even if it's online, it's still best not to publish a draft, probably even better not to publish a draft. So that's been an interesting challenge. Uh, the project is challenging for other reasons. I've noticed that certain poems and other Arabic texts get translated three or four times, and I imagine it's a little easier if your work has been translated by one or two people before you. Uh, even if it's into, say, French or German instead of into English, it gives you a little help. This text has a few scattered fragments have been published in abridged versions that are sometimes more confusing due to the apparatus of the abridgment than the actual Arabic text. Uh, so this is a totally you know, unpublished text. There are only about a million of these in, in the Islamic tradition that have yet only a few hundred at most texts have been translated, at least Arabic texts in the Islamic tradition, uh, into English. Uh, so it's been an excite, exciting challenge. What, what makes it, and maybe this is something we can talk about too, because I'd love to find out I've been doing the wrong thing for the last four years. Um, when you're translating a commentary on a text, you're really translating two texts. You're translating the original text, which in this case happens to be the most sacred book for Muslims, the Quran, and then the commentator's interpretation of it. And so the question is, should the translation of the Quran reflect what the commentator thought it meant, or what I think it means, or what someone who knows more about the Quran thinks it means. So that's, that's a challenge I've been wrestling with. This comes out most dramatically in a very famous, one of the most famous verses of the Quran is usually called the throne verse, in which uh, the, there's a reference to God's throne, uh, and it's the only time this word kursi, now kursi just means chair in Arabic, but it, it means something, well, it means a bunch of things. According to my commentator, though it doesn't mean throne. So now I have the problem of translating the throne verse, which he thinks actually means knowledge. So it's now the knowledge verse. Uh, so how does, how does that work? Well, fortunately we have footnotes, at least in the annotated edition, so I can say this is normally considered the throne verse, even though this commentator doesn't think it means throne at all. So these are some of the challenges, in addition just the sheer scope, the magnitude, the foolishness I perhaps went into this project, um, the lack of great examples preceding it, at least from Arabic into English. Um, but as anything kind of crazy, it's a lot of fun, and hopefully, inshallah, as we say, God willing, uh, it'll get done by next September. Yeah. <laughs>
Thanks. Well, I'm even more nervous than you going after the, th the three of you because um, I, I think David, David asked me to be on this panel, uh, I think because it says, uh, how is translation mediated across cultures, genres, and discourses in ways that may, may not be easily recognizable? I'm in the not easily recognizable part because I don't really do translation at all. Um, so why am, I, why am I even here? And David said, well, you know, talk a little bit about the work that you do with this journal that you've, you're a, a founding co-editor of. So I am the founding co-editor of a journal called uh, TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly. Uh, which is really trying to help consolidate the field of transgender studies, uh, looking at any um, manifestations and expressions of gender and gender identity um, that call our attention to the uh, sort of unnaturalness and constructedness of gender, the variability of gender across cultures, the emergence of new gender categories. And so we, because we're envisioning this as a, a, a truly uh, international publication, we're having to deal not only with the usual questions of like how do you reach a global audience and not, not just an Anglophone audience, but this very concept transgender is very Anglophone in the way that it, it's constructed. Uh, partly because gender itself as a category is a very Anglophone concept. So what I thought I would do is just a, a quick little capsule history of the idea of gender, the, the, the gender concept itself, and how it's moved across different, as it says here on the page, moved across different cultures, genres, and discourses. So that the, um, the way that the concept of gender came to be used in English is shockingly recent. Um, uh, that usually the way it gets used now, you say sex is biological and gender is cultural. Um, you know, sex is, you know, what gonads do you have, and, and gender is how do you express a sense of masculinity or femininity. But that distinction was not made in English until the middle of the 20th century. And where it actually started uh, was in medical discourse. There was a man by the name of John Money, um, who was a psychoneuroendocrinologist at Johns Hopkins University. And his work involved um, working with people that you know, were once called hermaphrodites, now are called intersex, um, sometimes are called having disorders of sex development. Um, but basically people born with ambiguous genitals, not clearly uh, male or female. Uh, and that what John Money noticed in working with these people is like, oh, you know, here are people who don't have a clearly legible sex and yet almost all of them have a clear sense of being a man or a woman. You know, what's the relationship between their sense of self as like fitting into a social category versus their physical anomalies? And he was trying to come up with some concept or term that would explain this thing that he saw, the distinction between a sense of self and a, a form of body. And he thought, oh, there is a word that kind of means this. It's the concept of gender that we can take from language. Just, you know, that, that gender just being a relatively arbitrary classification of nouns. It's like a noun has a gender and it doesn't really relate to anything except it's this category, not that category. So that money brought the concept of gender, translated gender, I guess you could say, from linguistics to medicine. It moves from money then talking about what he called gender, gender orientation. That was his first, he didn't use gender by itself as a term, he talked about gender orientation. So he wanted to talk about biological sex and gender orientation, that is which category does an organism think it belongs to, uh, which gender is it oriented towards. And then this gets picked up from neuroendocrinology by psychiatry, um, mostly, um, uh, first of all, a psychiatrist at UCLA by the, by the name of Robert Stoller. And Stoller develops this three-part um, model of human subjectivity. There's the biological sex, there's the gender identity, which is like the sense of how a person identifies themselves as being a man or a woman, 
which is usually congruent with biological sex, but doesn't have to be. And then third, there's gender role. So that is, there's the, how, do you express your, how do you express your psychological identity through your social behaviors? So this three-part thing, sex, gender identity, gender role. It then moves from psychiatry into feminism. You know, that, that um, this idea of being able to make a distinction between your biological sex and your role uh, and your sense of being a man or a woman was seen as useful for that. You know, precisely what Simone de Beauvoir was writing about in The Second Sex. You know, she says, one is not born a woman, but rather one becomes one. You know, the idea that a biological sex shouldn't um, force you into any particular social category and that the idea of gender or social role being something that's socially constructed and transformable, that feminists saw the idea of gender as analytically and politically useful. So it moves out of psychiatry into feminism and then from feminism it enters into social sciences in the academy primarily through feminist social scientists who are saying, no, studying gender inequality is an important part of the social sciences. You can study the sociology of gender and the history of gender and the psychology of gender. And so that gender then moves, as an analytical concept, moves into uh, broader academic discourse and becomes one of the major analytical categories like race or like class. So anyway, I can tell, talk a little bit more about how Based on this concept of gender, you start developing ideas of transgenders, and then the difficulties of applying that concept of transgender across cultures where the very concept of gender doesn't actually fit with you know, how people in different cultures think about the relationship between their body, their social role, their sexuality, and their identity. So lots of sort of second order problems come up in trying to talk about transgender, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> our basic question that the panel is going to be discussing is how is translation mediated or how does translation mediate across cultures, genres, and discourses? But you know, one of the, you know, we can talk about culture in, in many different ways, whether we're talking about historical you know, cultures or you know, cultures over time uh, translating from the original to uh, a new language um, or in the case of Daily, you know, you're, you're dealing with one, the, the tone of them, to Spanish, to English. I mean, there's several things, but also over the course of two centuries. Um, and just to set this up, I wanted to just mention one thing as, as I was thinking about this panel, which is you know the, the, the Latin root of the word translation, which is translatio, which uh, comes from you know, moving from one side to another, from one area to another, however we define that area, whether it's a group or a, you know, one language area or even a historical period to another. So I'm just gonna toss that out and if you all want to interact with each other, that would be even, even better. Um, how does this, you know, how does translation mediate across uh, cultures as you've seen it? <clears throat> Well, this is a gigantic topic. Yes, it is. <laughs> 15 minutes. Uh, so, if somebody wants to start. Well, I, I, I came across a very exciting anecdote, and I just thank you, David, for inviting me so I can share it with someone other than my immediate family. Um, but it just so happens here's, here's a little question Does anyone know what is possibly the first English book published on a printing press in England in 1477? It's not the Bible, sorry. It's not the, it's not the Quran, thank you. That would be truly awesome. That would have really made my day. But uh, anyone know? It's a book called The Dicts, Dicts and Sayings of the Philosophers, which is a Middle English translation of a late 14th century French translation of a 13th century Latin translation of an early 13th century Spanish translation of an Arabic book written in either 1048 or 1049, called Mukhtar al-Hikam wa Mahasan al-Kalim, the choicest aphorisms and best sayings by a man named Mubashir bin Fatik in Egypt, which claims to contain the wisdom and exhortations of ancient Greek philosophers. <laughs> you got that? Yes. It wasn't a bestseller. As the uh, recent editor said, despite its popularity in the 15th century, the text had almost no impact on later English writing. I believe the chief reason is that then as now, Dixon Sayings is a very unwieldy text. 
However, on the Islamic studies side, where of course this is a little bit maybe more exciting than in the English department side of things, uh, Franz Rosenthal, who spent a lot of time studying this, one of the great uh, Orientalists in the non-pejorative sense of Orientalism, one of the real masters of philology and texts, uh, quotes all these translations, with the possible exception of the Provençal edition, about which we know little, uh, were landmarks in the literary and intellectual history of the Western European nations. Over a period of 300 years, they were used and read by the best minds. So clearly two different interpretations of the impact of this translation. And then what struck me the most is that in 2006, this text was re-edited in the Middle English and published without any consultation of anyone who knows Arabic. The Arabic text was published in 1958. Unfortunately, Rosenthal was about to publish it when an Egyptian beat him to the punch. And so he wrote an article saying, this would have been the preface to my edition of this text, but this Egyptian scholar who's very good published in it, and so I don't have to do that anymore, uh, any longer. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I just happened to find a little time to skim a few pages, and the differences are quite substantial. So when the new editor writes that it's essentially the same text as the Arabic, that's totally incorrect from the you know, maybe 20 pages I had time to skim in the last few weeks. Anyway, these kinds of connections uh, you know, are not ones we often think about. We hear about translation movements here and there, but here you see this really dramatic case of a, of a book that isn't even really about Muhammad or the Quran. It's about what happened <laughs> supposedly in Greece and... and the Near East going all the way around through Spain, Latin, all the way to Mary mm. England. Um, that it's a very interesting proposition, and uh, uh, almost as complex and uh, as vast mm. as the question, the first question for this colloquium. Uh, you know, issues of, besides the languages and the cultures and the time spans and the chronology, uh, issues of interpretation, agency, uh, vicariousness, subjectivity uh, come into place. So the, the, the big question here, I think, is the, the strategy that I've been looking for in order to answer uh, this question is what, what, what can we do as a society in order to make sure that all these perspectives, opinions, views uh, have uh, a way to participate and to express themselves, among other things, giving, uh, bringing into this discourse, into this dialogue, all the constituents, all the stakeholders, uh, so they can themselves look at their own issues and voice their own opinions and then have a meaningful dialogue. So I think that in order to foster the discourse of translation and interpretation in multilingual and multicultural societies, and globalization has you know, uh, brought so much interaction uh, <coughs> into the realm, I think that we really have to look for advanced social policies that guarantee equal access and that uh, foster, that, that implement policies that foster equal access and representation and cover the spectrum of ideological positions. That's something that Professor Aji mentioned today in his lecture this morning, because there are so many interests, so many competing interests, and competition is good. You know, but the first thing that we need to have is to have a setup, a social setup, a political setup that really gives a voice to all the participants. <clears throat> so I think that in order uh, to see how translation has mediated across cultures, one of the things that we can learn from translation is that when uh, the different groups the different languages, the different cultures really don't have access. They cannot participate in this course. In, in this course, there is a lot of conflict that arises. So we can learn from the past, and as a modern uh, society, what we can do is just to make sure that we implement policies that open the door and that give a voice to all those people who are part of our societies. So we will not have to deal with problems of you know, not having really a record that gives a voice to people who only have an oral tradition as a literary tradition because it is not being taken into account if we really don't pay attention to those groups, to those languages, to those traditions that are not part of the written record of translation, <coughs> uh, purely speaking. So I think that the first thing that we have to do is to make sure that we have uh, the social mechanisms, the political mechanisms that uh, respect this diversity and that foster this dialogue among people who speak different languages and have different cultures. What would you, what would you recommend? What would you think of as some of these? Uh, 
Well, what, we, what, are, what are some of the deficiencies as you've seen them? Would you care to elaborate? Uh, we have a number of uh, federal standards, for instance, like Title VI, that actually uh, are very specific as to giving access to people on the basis of uh, avoiding discrimination on the basis of cultural differences, uh, specifically from government agencies that receive federal funds. This title, Title VI, that is something that comes up uh, out of the social struggle for civil rights in, during the 50s and the 60s, declares it to be the policy of the United States uh, that discrimination on the ground of race, color, and national origin and language is implicitly comprehended and there is much jurisprudence uh, that makes linguistic meaningful participation part of, of national identity and national origin shall not occur in connection with prom programs and activities that receive, receive federal funding. So for instance, uh, mm, Native American groups should be brought <coughs> also because of, of for historical reasons into any dialogue, any initiatives that take into account uh, mm, the voice, the language, the culture, and the history of the lands where they have been living for thousands of years. Uh, groups that are representative or that are significant, <coughs> significant for their numbers or in those venues that are fundamental for the well-being of a person that are considered basic rights, like could be legal uh, settings, access to, uh, to justice, access to healthcare, and so on. So it is a federal mandate right now by Title VI and also by Executive Order 13166, that is a, an order that came out during the uh, Clinton presidency, that those institutions that receive federal funding have to provide those type of services. In general, it is my belief that uh, society that is that, uh, that fosters respect dialogue that is mindful of this diversity and respectful and implements the, the means necessary it, to to facilitate this dialogue among languages and cultures is a society that brings concord into the realm and that fosters uh, peace, peaceful cohabitation. And that also is beneficial uh, socially, politically, economically, and of course culturally. You know, and that gives rise to a, a whole sort of movements that have to do with, with culture, with expression, with freedom, with literatures, with oral traditions that are very enriching of, of the social experience. So <clears throat> we already have many instruments in place, uh, many policies that we oftentimes fail to implement as a society and we don't abide by them. And I can give you some specific examples, but I don't want to take all the time because I'm sure that my colleagues <coughs> Well, you mentioned the, the oral tradition and the written tradition, and one of the things that strikes me, strikes me at hearing all four of you is the dialogic nature, whether we're talking about the, the, the English translations of the Spanish colonial documents of the Tohono practices and so forth, um, whether it's the uh, oral interpretation or whether we're even talking about the, the commentary of the Quran and the, the, the problems. I mean, would you all care to look into that? I mean, there is a, as you mentioned, Scott, for instance, the uh, idea of which one do you translate? Do you translate the Quran as he understood it? I mean, how do you, how do you approach that? Uh, yeah, uh, well, anytime you translate the Quran, one should be pretty careful, um, especially if it's going to be put online, potentially, uh, as, as I mentioned. Uh, <laughs> yes, one should be, one should be careful. Um, I mean, fortunately, we do have things like footnotes, and you can kind of, I mean, what you also want to avoid is writing a commentary on the commentary on the text, right? There, there's how, because that'll add another 10 years to this project, and, <laughs> and I don't think they'll be as charitable 10 years from now as they are now, um, as well as the great distance, of course, which helps. Um, but I think, I mean, there are just these huge issues of, of, you know, at least in our field, which, which text do you begin to translate, you know, as a representative sample? Do you need to have a representative sample, or do you just pick texts that you, you, you enjoy? Um, there are issues of the style of these texts. They, they include lots of names that nobody today really cares about, but for someone like me, or who, who's interested in this period, these are very important names. Each individual who's quoted uh, has some significance. Um, so that's important. And then, of course, the value, and I, I encourage, I mean, I hope I haven't discouraged anyone from trying to translate a Quran commentary, although I could see why they might come to that conclusion. Um, but we get asked all the time, what does the Quran say about X? Or what does Islam say about X? 
which of course you don't, you know, you just say, what does Germany say about why? I mean, no one, no one, I think, says that. But these are the kinds of questions we face all the time. And it's handy to say, well, there's diversity of opinion, but it's all in Arabic and so you can't read it. And I don't have time to tell you or I haven't read it myself. So there's a great value, I think, especially given um, the tensions between parts of the Muslim world and the United States, uh, various assumptions. I was at a, an interfaith kind of event the other day where the assumption, you know, this man thought he had it all figured out that you know, the Muslim world, which he, by which he meant the Arab world, which is totally two very different things, was stuck in the 1500s, and now they're trying to get to 2000. You know, these kinds of ideas, if we can show, actually, you know, some of the, probably the best Marxists in the 20th century were Arabs, you know? I mean, that might not please this gentleman, but uh, you know, they weren't in the 15th century, right? This is, this is something, uh, you know, a gross misunderstanding of, of what's going on. So, it has a crucially valuable, for any, as I think it's underrepresented group, I think much of the Muslim world, despite being large population-wise, in terms of one's curriculum uh, growing up in the United States or elsewhere, one learns very little, bit, little, and unfortunately one learns a lot from the media, which is frequently uh, less than accurate. So it, it has a crucial role in mediating, I think, between that, but it is very time-consuming, and there are not a lot of us who uh, have positions that allow us at least some of the time to, to do these kinds of things. And, and I can have some, you know, suggestions as how to proceed Please. Uh, <laughs> with this difficult situation. Uh, there are not many published translations that you can use, but there are certainly a few dozen. So uh, having access to the historical record of, the, of previous translations and also the commentaries and how those have been received and which are the values because there are a few that emerge as they're really the milestones and the most representative so during those times. Also, you know, you have to engage in an etymological analysis. Uh, you have to mm, all proceed with an interlinear literal translation and then start interpreting that in terms of uh, context depending when the text was uh, also prepared. There are many historical and cultural circumstances that have to be sure. taken into account to see how the meaning have, has evolved or devolved uh, from that time on. Connotation and denotation. Uh, also other examples within uh, other traditions, you know, uh, sacred texts from other traditions that have uh, the Bible studies. The Bible is the, the book that has been uh, counts with the largest number of translations. Uh, and also, and this, I think this is crucial, consult with other translators. Mm -hmm. People who have experience in the field, and then once you have a good sketch, a good draft of what you want to do, and your strategies, then you send to somebody who you, you trust, or a community of translators, and they say, hey, look, I'm working on this, and this is, and you know, sometimes your colleagues really give you a lot of input. That way you cover all the technical bases, and then when your work goes out, you can say, well, you know, I, 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 people, so yes. it's not just my fault. I, I did my homework, and actually, many of the well respected scholars in the field mm -hmm. agree with this approach. Mm -hmm. and so, so. The other thing that strikes me listening to all, all four of you is uh, there's a commonality among the work you're doing, which is this notion of I mean, it's not just translating from culture to culture or language to language, but also historically, whether we're talking about, I mean, again, Dale, you're covering two centuries. And certainly the practices, both of the people writing and of the people they're describing, were changing over time. Susan, you also mentioned the evolution of the word gender, and that too, and Scott as well, with the first book in English. I mean, that is a, a different set of problems. That is, how do you approach you know, this, the fact that the, the, whatever it is you're working on has a history as well? Yeah, yeah just a, another example that comes out of some of my work, one of the main historical figures that I'm doing research on is this woman named Christine Jorgensen, who was the first uh, globally famous sex-changing person, um, and that the word transsexual was coined largely in relationship to her. That you know, the, the practice predated the word for it, and that the, the name came about as a way to try to distinguish people who use surgery and hormones to change their body, to change their social and legal identity uh, in a way that distinguished them from homosexuals or from cross-dressers or many of these other transgender terms. Um, and part of what I'm looking at in Jorgensen's career is that as a, uh, a person from the U.S. who gets called this word that gets coined in the U.S., and yet she's truly globally uh, visible, uh, 
how is it that this term and this identity category and this particular mode of doing one's body, uh, how is it received in different cultures and languages around the world? Because it means something different every place it lands. Um, I've done some work on a film that was made in the Philippines in the early 1960s in which Christine Jorgensen has an extended cameo role in this film. And even though I don't think it's what the filmmakers were thinking when they made the film, for me as a cultural studies person, I see this very complicated dialogue going on about how the word transsexual is being received and how it relates to currently existing terms for sexuality and gender identity. The, the, the film is called Kaming Muga Taliada, AKA, We Who Are Sexy. That it was, had both a, a Tagalog or Filipino um, um, title as well as an English translation. And that, that word Taliada, which was translated as sexy, that Taliada was um, um, a slang word uh, that basically meant, um, it, 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 was, it was considered a euphemism for the word bakla, that bakla is a, a, a very pejorative word, basically it means like faggot, um, but that taliada was, would be something like sissy, that it was, um, but it's translated as sexy into English, and what the, what the root of the word meant, it came from the Spanish tallar, like to cut, right? And so it literally means someone who's cut um, and that it, idiomatically it meant like someone who cuts a nice figure, somebody who has a nice shape. But when it's used about a woman, taliada, it's considered, um, uh, it's praise, it's, you know, it's a, a form of praise, but when you sculpt it, sculpt it right, you know. Um, but when it's used about a male person, it's considered pejorative, but it has all the connotations then of being um, aesthetic without being functional. It has an, a connotation of being artificially contrived, like a sculpture rather than natural and organic. It has the connotation of being emasculated. And so you have all of these words, or all these associations around the word taliada. And then how does the transsexual come into this? It's like it brings different, a different set of connotations to being cut to being emasculated, to being non-functional. And so how, so, so that the, the translation of the transsexual into this existing category, taliada, it means something very different in the Filipino context than it did in an English language context. And so this film then be kind of becomes a mediation on how um, a US derived term is taken up in existing categories of sexuality and gender identity in the Philippines in ways that different kinds of national imaginaries get worked out around the introduction of this U.S. character. So. so, so the film really is a translator. What? The film is a translator. The film is a translator. It's like it's figuring out how you fit the transsexual into <laughs> bakla and taliada. And there's even more complicated things going on in the film about h how it is that um, uh, Filipino ideas of, um, of being taliada are compatible with nationalist ideas, that it's like a man could be taliada and still marry and have children. Um, uh, the Taliata characters of the film, besides Christine Jorgensen, all wind up serving in the military. So they serve the nation and the state and the family in many different ways. But to become transsexual, to be physically cut in this American way, rather than being culturally, you know, feminine, it's, it doesn't it doesn't um, it doesn't reproduce the nation in the same way. So there's a a way that Filipino national identity is warding off on the one hand. Um, an American, U.S. American construction of self, and at the same time, they're fighting against a moral insurgency where they're doing sexuality and gender another way that's represented as being an internal feminine Islamicized threat is, is to the, the nation. The nation as the fatherland or as the motherland? The fatherland, <laughs> for sure. And 
That's very, very interesting. And I, I see why David invited you to be part of this panel, because it's, it's really phenomenal. I mean, I see so many parallelisms and, you know, make, gets me thinking about uh, many of the things that you are saying. Uh, if Mr. Moderator, we don't have much time and there is a second question here yes, that is, is an interesting question that is, what are the current conditions for translating underrepresented literatures, histories and cultures? Uh, there, is, there are a couple of things that I would like to say about that, if you allow me to. Uh, I think that we can summarize that my answer to that question as better than before, but it's still very bad. <coughs> So those are the current conditions for translating and their, and their represented literatures, histories, and cultures. But in specifically, I would like to do a little meta commentary here as to a particular culture that is the translation culture mm -hmm. or the culture of translators, uh, which in my opinion is underrepresented, is an underrepresented culture in academia. I would like to encourage all of you to read, if you haven't read it, uh, the uh, letter, the article that Catherine Porter, who was the president of the Modern Language Association, wrote in the year 2009 uh, advocating for translation and its importance within uh, the humanities. And also, advocating for the practice of translation and interpretation within comparative literatures and <coughs> uh, the language department. Uh, we also are discussing here written translation, uh, and I mentioned before that oral translation interpretation is, uh, is uh, very important. In my, in my opinion, also interpretation is underrepresented within the field of translation studies. Uh, so. I think that those are the, actually the Modern Language Association. I was invited in the year 2007 uh, to give a talk precisely on this topic. And there is a task force that put together a document that it is a very interesting piece of research uh, that really illustrate why translation and interpretation should be a very important part um, in uh, language departments in the humanities. So, <clears throat> in fact, you anticipated my last question, which is exactly that, which is, you know, and, you know in terms of the, at the academic, and in, in academic life, you know, translation traditionally, typically, at least in the humanities, it's not unimportant, but it's, it's usually lesser than some other forms of scholarship. Mm -hmm. And how do we address that? Um, you have to grab people and shake them and <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, of course. <laughs> Make them understand what we're doing. <laughs> no, it's, it's something that I've run up against personally. When you're saying that you're, you, you spent eight years translating, you know, 93 documents or document groups, people, they don't, it has no meaning to them. They have no idea what's involved. And, you know, what do you mean that this first version, this draft is, is not good? You know, what? <laughs> <laughs> As Scott mentioned, you don't want to publish a draft. <laughs> As Scott mentioned, you know, you don't want to. So it's, it's just, uh, I don't know how we do it other than just try to explain to people what it is that we're doing. And, and if I may go beyond, I think that within translation and comparative linguistics, the practice is also marginalized compared to theoretical studies. There is much more importance to the theory of translation and interpretation, which is, of course, very, very important. But, you know, I think that the best possible world is when you bring the theory and the practice together and you establish a cross meaningful com cross communication so one can inform the other. And that is not happening. <coughs> I, th I think that we need to make people somehow understand that we are not translating text in a void. You know, it's not, we have to put it into its context. We have to do a lot of research to understand ourselves as well as help our readers understand the motivations behind that reading or that writing, how it was presented, why it was presented that way. Um, and everything else, the impact of, of this piece of writing on the people in our case of the time. So. 
Great. Well, I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, please join me in thanking the panelists.